Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to this time of worship. Now, if you're a visual person, it might matter to you. You may be noticed that we keep changing these paramounts, these fabrics in the sanctuary. Last week they were green, which was kind of neat that that coincided with Scout Sunday and all the scouts in their greenish brown. But friends, today it's white. Because um, when it's white, that's kind of a big Sunday in the liturgical year. This Sunday is the Sunday of transfiguration. The story of Jesus going up to the mountaintop. He took a couple of disciples with him. And what unfolded up there on top of the mountain is extraordinary. And this is the Sunday of transfiguration. It's all white. When Jesus is transformed and is bedazzled and dazzling white, the next time, where's Matthew and Mackenzie? So watch. Sometimes it's fun for children to pay attention to the colors. Next week, it's not going to be white. It'll be something else for the next few weeks. And then the next time it's white is Easter Sunday. And so we are traveling between the white, the glorious white of transfiguration and the glorious white of Easter Sunday. Let us worship God. call ourselves, oh, we've had our, let's call ourselves to worship using the words that are printed in your bulletin. Great is the Lord. Mighty is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Let us worship our God and our King.
change our lives and give us you? Yay. I was hoping you'd be here this morning. Morning. Good morning. And there's Clark. All right. I was thinking about you. I'm wondering if you have something like this in your classroom. No? A number line? It's like this. It's the number line. Oh, I'm so glad you came today, Cupcake. In your first grade classroom, <laughs> save me here. Do you have a number line hanging up? Ha! Ah, I knew it. I was a first grade teacher. You call my sister a cupcake. I just called your sister a cupcake. I know. Those just come out of my mouth. So you use this during math class, am I right? And so when in first grade, when we were learning, we'd take hops on the number line to do some adding, and sometimes that was the beginning, adding and subtracting on the number line. All right. All right, Matthew, even though you don't have one in third grade, this number line, what's the highest number on it? Ten. Is ten the, big, the greatest number ever? Is that as far as it goes? No. How far does it go? How far does the number line go? What's a big number? A billion? Does it stop at a billion? No. No, a billion's not the biggest number. So what's the biggest number? What's even bigger than a billion? Pardon? A quadrillion. But then if you have a quadrillion, you can, you can add one more, bingo. Bingo. Do you hear what Clark just said? He said infinity. But on a technicality, infinity is not a number, but it means it goes on forever and ever and ever this way. Numbers, am I right, finance people in the front pew? N this goes on forever. How about this way on the number line? This one goes Three, two, one, zero, negative one. Have you noticed those in your first grade classroom? Negative two, negative three. How far does this go? Forever. It's infinity. You get, it's that way, forever. The number line, this is only a piece of it because numbers go on forever in both directions. Mm-hmm. Because it goes zoink. This is just a piece of it. You know what? Number lines help me to think about God. And that's why I brought a piece of a number line today. Because the God is here with us today, knows us by name. God is here. And God always was. Always was. When these people sitting here were babies, when settlers and pioneers were, in, were settling the United States, dinosaur time, God was there before the dinosaurs forever. God, God forever was there. And then when you look to the future, God forever will be in the future. When this church is an old ancient ruin, God will be here. Because the God that we worship every Sunday is the God who was, the God who is, and the God who forever will be. That's why I brought the number line. <sighs> Thank you for coming up.
have fun at Discovery Time, which might be a little bit longer today because the adults have a meeting, so you'll stay a little bit longer. So thank you for coming. <laughs> I know. I was they have some energy. <laughs> Friends, announcements. Um, so you have this lovely liturgical purple pullout for the season of Lent. And here you have, <clears throat> beginning on Fat Tuesday, when um, <clears throat> that tradition of um, eating all the high fats before you sort of are a little more pared down during the Lenten season. I don't know if you practice that, but we're, um, again, giving out some donuts. Just drive through, and we'll give you a donut on Tuesday morning to celebrate Fat Tuesday. This Wednesday evening is Ash Wednesday. Um, it, in one place, it says it's in the sanctuary. In another place, it's in Crossroads. It will be in Crossroads. And this year, we're doing a um, candlelit contemplative prayer service on Wednesday evening. So I invite you to that. Then throughout the 40 days of Lent, there'll be this opportunity, fun food and faith. It's every Wednesday, it's five Wednesdays, and there's, it's intergenerational and there's multiple ways for you to participate. I feel like there's no fast way to say this. At 4 o'clock, it will begin, and children are invited. Mrs. Brunner will, teach, will give them a music class, a music lesson, a little, a little chorus and instruments, and we'll see. Maybe they'll have a little something for us by Easter Sunday. And then adults can drop off their children and go take a nap or a walk, or you can come to the church kitchen and help prepare a meal. And during that time of preparation, We'll also be, um, I'll be leading some discussion as we chop and cook and think about some of the table theology and the time that Jesus, Jesus spent a lot of time at the table eating, often with unsavory characters. And so we'll look at that. With dinner then at 5.30, the children will come and it will be an intergenerational dinner at 5.30. So do you see you can drop off your children? If you don't have children to drop off, you can come to the kitchen and help and discuss. Or you could just come to dinner at 5.30 and just have dinner. We have it at 5.30 because we thought that was a really good time for people who don't like to drive at night. It won't be really dark when you leave. And then also for children, you can go home and get that whole bedtime machine going. So do you have to come every single Friday? No, but we'd love you to. But if you can only come one or three, come for as much as you can. Um, I think that this is a, in this season of church life, I love the idea that we break bread together, that we have some meals together to forge some of those bonds that many of you have with each other, but that you could establish some new bonds. And it's also intergenerational. It's not just for kids. It's not just for old folks. It's not just for youth. It's intergenerational. Um, I can give my witness that as a married woman with no children moving to Philadelphia when my husband and I joined a church, we then had grandparents again. We then had the grandparents, and those relationships meant the world to us as we grew our family. Um, and I've heard many of you testify, yep, testify to the strength of the bonds that you have made with people in this congregation for 25 or 30 years. And that's great, but I think we need to, and, not but, and I think we need to continue to grow those bonds as we're together in community. There's a couple of presentations during adult ed throughout Lent, and then you'll see the Holy Week services at the bottom. So we made this for you thinking you can put it on your refrigerator and so you know what's coming up in the next 
in the season of Lent and Holy Week. This, I'm sorry it didn't make the bulletin, their um, fellowship committee has planned a fun evening that's this Friday, the 24th of February. It begins with a hoagie dinner at 6 o'clock, and it's a, it's a game, it's a game, is that the right word, called uh, Telestrations, and that will follow the dinner. It's for all ages. They would like an RSVP um, so that you'll, they know how many hoagies to buy, right? And then um, you can do that. How can you RSVP on the website, and how else? Is there a sign-up? No? But it's this Friday. Oh. Wow. Okay. Okay, so it's not a late breaking announcement, and it's not an omission from the bulletin. Wow, you have a lot to look forward to. How about that? I've given you a little preview without even meaning to. Um, I also need, apparent, in your bulletin is a PCUSA form for earthquake relief in Syria and Turkey. There is on that form a blank space that says the PIN number of your church, and that's not filled in. And you go, what's the PIN number? Well, the PIN number is, if you have little golf pencils in your pews, it's 07995. 07995, and that's helpful for record keeping. The most important thing is that money is donated, but in the event you do, it's helpful if you have the pin 07995, or at least write the name of the church. And I think that's all the announcements for today. Thank you.
before we read the word of God in Exodus, pray with me. Holy God, you reveal to the disciples the everlasting glory of Jesus Christ. Grant us who have not seen and yet believe the gift of your Holy Spirit, that we may boldly live the gospel and shine with your transforming glory as people changed and changing through the redeeming presence of our Savior. Amen. Listen to God's word, Exodus 24, 12 through 18. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there. I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up unto the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, wait here for us until we come back to you. Look, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain and in the sight of the Israelites. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. The word of God. So as I, before I read from the Gospel of Matthew, I want to acknowledge the beautiful flowers here um, on the communion table. Those are a gift from the Black family. Um, yesterday we had a memorial service for the celebration of life of Suzanne Black here in the sanctuary. And um, Greg sang two different songs to honor his wife. And um, I got to sit in a rocking chair in the back and take in the festivities. And I know that as Greg was singing, I believe the roof of this building was lifted a couple inches higher with the, there was praise in his voice as he sang. And so we want to remember um, Greg, who was an elder of this congregation and this season of grief and celebration that he's living in these beautiful flowers um, they've left for us to enjoy. So let me switch now. So there's this grand narrative, right, from Alpha to Omega, from A to Z, it's God's story, and I'm going to zero in on a segment of the number line, and we're going to zero in on that piece of scripture that tells a piece of that grand narrative. This is the 17th chapter of Matthew. So friends, we've skipped way ahead. We've skipped way ahead. I always feel like we just got through Christmas and we're now, now Jesus is, um, he's, he's done a lot of ministry, a lot of healing and teaching, a lot of some table turning and um, things are heating up for Jesus. And this happens in the 17th chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 9, otherwise known as the story of the transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Oh, if you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While Peter was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice 
said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And then they looked up and they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So where are we in that grand narrative and that whole sweeping story that that goes on forever. We're at the top of a roller coaster, friend. It's where we're wearing white. It's a big deal. That's where we are. We're on the mountaintop with Jesus. And did you see how that story ends? Jesus goes back down into the valley. We are about to follow Jesus down into the valley. Another way is to ask the same question is to say, well, where are we in this continuous thread of God's unfolding story? As I've said, Jesus has been busy, has been on the move, healing, teaching, comforting, disrupting, storytelling, all those parables. He has attracted followers, many, 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 and also Jesus has aroused suspicion at this point in the story. His very presence threatens the authority and the powers of empire. And today's gospel reading is a story of Jesus taking three of his disciples on a hike. I don't know why he picked those and not all 12. My guess is they kind of went, well, this will be fun, a little hike up the mountain. You'll bring a picnic lunch. It was nothing, kind of expecting something ordinary, and it was quite extraordinary. Scripture tells us that Jesus was transfigured before them, right? He, whatever that means, however we can get our heads around that, that Jesus, whose body, bodily there, was transfigured, right? His face shone like the sun, and his clothes were dazzling white. I want you to notice this. So sometimes this thread that runs through everything, sometimes the thread of God's story, it's easy to spot. And other times you can read a piece of, a piece of scripture and you don't quite, you kind of lose the thread. You're not sure where it is. Has anyone here ever read a bewildering, <laughs> bewildering, strange story in the Bible? And it strikes you as, what? That's in the Bible? Um, And it gives you pause and you start to wonder, where is God in this story, right? Has anyone, has that happened to somebody? Some of them, thank God for Bible studies, right? When you go, wait, like, let's see if we can figure this out together. But in this story of the transfiguration, I think that the thread is more obvious. It's just given to us. And I invite you to note that this thread, it it runs right through it. So we're on the top of the mountain, And then we look back, right, Moses and Elijah, they're Old Testament folks, but there they are in conversation with Jesus, right? The past is suddenly in this story. And we remember it was Elijah in the wilderness, and the famine was going on, and God sent him out and said, rely on my provision. Does this ring a bell? And Elijah's out there, and the crows came to him and fed him. Um, And we remember Moses was on a mountaintop, yes, and he went up in the booming voice of God, and he was given the Ten Commandments. And in that case, there was a a 
cloud that moved in for six days, right? And Moses hung out in this, in this confusion of the cloud that rolled in. And um, notice in this story that the fog comes in. There's a fog that comes in. And Matthew's account that you just heard, do you hear the echoes, right? This voice from heaven, you are my son, my beloved. When did you hear that? Right at the baptism of Jesus. Remember when he was baptized by John in the Jordan when the heavens were ripped open and the spirit descended like a dove? It's that. It's an echo of that same voice announcing this. So another way to think of God's unfolding narrative is to imagine a thread that runs through all that was and is and forever shall be. And today we're on the mountaintop and we're about to descend into the valley below, otherwise known as the season of Lent. Every year, the Sunday before Lent, this is the scripture of the transfiguration. This, friends, is the path here on to the cross and the glory of the resurrected Jesus on Easter morning, right? And I told the children that's the next time we'll have white in our sanctuary. But hold on, not so fast. We can't get ahead of ourselves and get all excited and get up our energy for the resurrection because we have something before us today, and that is the glory of the transfiguration. See, it's like bookends. We have this glorious transfiguration, the white light on the mountaintop, and we have the glorious resurrection on Easter morning. So what? So what? It's always the pastor's question. So what? Yeah, yeah, this is the story. What does this have to do with us? How might this story, this revelation at the top of the mountain, have anything to do with us? Well, we know that we are participants in God's unfolding, continuous story. Because our lives, as followers of Jesus, our lives are entwined totally entwined with a God who was and is and forever will be. What happened on that mountaintop long ago, when Jesus was transfigured before his disciples, is part of your personal lineage, a plot point in the narrative of God's story, and it's also part of your story. Okay. So uh, then that makes me wonder how or even if we can see the connection of this story to our story, to our own faith. Is there a connecting thread that runs through it that has anything to do with us? Especially when this story is so utterly spectacular, unusual, otherworldly. Right? It's a, it's a strange story. Well, praise God for poets. When Scripture serves up an amazing narrative, I don't know how to connect with it. I spend time with poets during the week. And poet Stephen Garnis Holmes wrote a poem and put it on Facebook, and it made a lot of sense to me, and it's called Weird. Every week this guy um, reads scripture, and he writes a few bits of poetry, and this one's called Weird. It's kind of long, so I'm only, read, I'm only going to read part of it to you. And the reason I want to read it to you is because this poet helped me to see how my life might have any connection whatsoever to this eventful day on the mountaintop so long ago. Oh, please don't explain this story. It's truly, divinely, accurately weird. Sure, there's a moral of the story, several in fact, 
theological constructs, stuff you should believe, fine. Hold those in your pocket. Meanwhile, sit there for a minute, cock your head a little, and just gawk at this story. This is about wonder, how Jesus shines. Life just shines. The glory of God spills out of things, leaks out of every container, even people. Being alive is beyond expectation. I'm sorry, beyond explanation. Grace is odd. Love doesn't make sense. And God is inexplicable. Faith is not about having religious opinions. It's not knowing. Certainly not certainty. Sometimes faith is just awe. The willingness to be bedazzled, to look at life and go, wow. When beauty and grace and loveliness overwhelm you, when words fail and being smart is no use, you sense God may be afoot, but you can't say how. All you can do is say, huh, what do you know? Wow. Let this story be weird. Let life be amazing. Let God be more than you can grasp. Your faith needn't be much more than grateful, gobsmacked wonder. If you really want to get religious, let this be your creed. Wow. Amen. I can't imagine a better invitation to Lent than this. I'd love to journey with this good and faithful congregation, to journey with you in your gratitude and your gobsmacked wonder in this Lenten season. But hold on. Hold on, you say. I've never been overwhelmed with a glorious light lately. I haven't heard any voices from heaven. There's no Jesus standing in front of me talking with Old Testament prophets. So I can testify today that though I've never seen anyone transfigured before me, bedazzled in white light. I haven't heard a voice from heaven. I've heard whispers, but I haven't heard a voice from heaven. I have experienced the unexplainable. I've been surprised by the sudden arrival of an answer to a long-held question. I believe that God has spoken to me on multiple occasions through other people, even total strangers. Once it was a cashier at Trader Joe's. God comes to me through friends who sometimes see me more clearly than I see myself. Yes, this I believe God does indeed reveal God's self to us. And admittedly, it's in a less spectacular way than what happened on the mountain but it is still divine and important and awe-producing. And so I ask you, have you noticed whispers? Maybe not even audible, but have you noted whispers, sometimes called nudgings of the spirit that give you pause and that you kind of brush it off and you kind of go, well, that was just coincidence or good luck. We'll never know for sure. Have you caught glimpses of the glory of God? This I believe, that though you and I have not seen the transfiguration of Jesus with your own eyes, there is much taking place at 
every moment that is too wonderful to be recognized. It's too amazing to be fully grasped. It's too startling to comprehend. It doesn't add up. Life with God is an endless feast of divine encounter. May we welcome this season of Lent to slow down, to pay attention, to open ourselves to the miracles available to us in every moment. They are swirling in and around. We just need to notice. The thread that connects us in and through God's story, it's our lifeline. Especially when the fog rolls in and God feels distant, sometimes even absent. Has anyone ever noticed, felt the absence of God, right? Where are you, God? Because I'm not feeling you, I'm not seeing you, I'm not noticing anything. And as people of faith, we hold on. There's another poem spoke to me this week by William Stafford, and it's printed on the cover of your bulletin. He says, there's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. And you have to explain about the thread, but it's hard for others to see. And while you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. I hear that as an invitation, yes? So this Lent, let us look for the glorious ways that God is making God's self known in our lives. Be bedazzled. Ignite your imaginations. Could that have been? Was that coincidence? Or was that the Spirit speaking to me? Participate in Lenten activities that have been planned for you or create your own. There's no one way to do this. Dwell richly with the Spirit. Maybe start a small practice where you read Scripture in the morning if you don't already, that you spend time in prayer, maybe at noon, midday, something new and small. Take a deeper dive and pursue a question that's been begging for your consideration. One way to figure out a question is to see if you can pinpoint what gives you fear. What gives you great fear right now? And that might be the question that you want to sit with and spend time with. You can join in Wednesday evenings here at church beginning on March 1st for meaningful engagement in the kitchen. What a great place to make meaning. And you can be there with old friends, and you can make new friends. Prepare a shared meal in the church kitchen. Eat dinner, break bread. Risk, take a risk. What might happen if you enlarge your comfort zone, your spiritual comfort zone? And hey, no promises. No promises for me that there might just be a flash of blinding light or a voice from the heavens, right? Those disciples had no clue when they decided to take that hike with Jesus. Just hold on. The spirit of the living God blows where it pleases. So come, let us follow Jesus down from the mountaintop, friends, to all that awaits us in the valley below. Hold on. Amen. And join us. <clears throat>
At this time, it is with great joy that we receive new members into the life of this congregation. If you would come forward, and I believe you're bringing someone you know quite well with you. If you would stand right here, please. That's great, and you can face the congregation. family. We celebrate that the Lord has led Kelly and Ed and Luke to worship and grow and serve with us in his name. We're excited about the impact that they will make here through their presence, their love, their talents, and as a congregation, we offer them support and rejoicing. We offer our church home as a place for you to strengthen your faith and deepen your discipleship. We want to love them we want to get to know them, and today we want to welcome them. Thank you. So friends, whenever we receive new members um, who have previously participated in the life of a congregation, which both Kelly and Ed have, they come to us by reaffirming their faith, which always has to do with our baptism. So it is always, it's within the waters of baptism that we remember our faith and we welcome Kelly and Ed. Now. So you come to us as members of the one holy Catholic church into which you were baptized. and by which you have been nurtured. I know in the Catholic faith you grew up in, in the Armenian Orthodox Church, the all that you experienced brought you to this moment. Everything that you are brings you to this time. But I know in the little while that I've come to know Kelly and Ed, a lot of their identity, I think if you want to get to know them, I think an important important part of their identity is that they are parents to three-year-old Luke, who goes to our nursery school. And I believe that it is actually in the, in the love of a parent that you have for Luke. It's hard to imagine, as much as you too love Luke, God loves you even more than that. And that's amazing. We are one with each other, sisters and brothers in the family of God. We rejoice in the gifts that you bring to us, and in, as you join with us in the worship and service of this congregation, it is fitting that together we affirm the covenant into which you were baptized, claiming again the promises of God, which are ours in baptism. And hear these words from Holy Scripture. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. Sisters and brothers in Christ, our baptism is the sign and the seal of our cleansing from sin, and of our being grafted into Christ through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ, the power of sin was broken, and God's kingdom entered our world. And through our baptism, we were made citizens of God's kingdom and freed from the bondage of sin. And now I have questions for Kelly and for Ed. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, say I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, say I do. Will you be 
Christ's faithful disciples, obeying his word and showing his love. If so, say, I will with God's help. And now let us all affirm our faith with Kelly and Ed, with Luke standing by. Maybe he'll remember this day, maybe not. And all of us, we need to stand on our feet as we say the Apostles' Creed, which you may know from memory, but will also be on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, on the right hand of God the Father Almighty and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Kelly and Ed, you have publicly professed your faith Will you be faithful members of this congregation, share in its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, maybe some cooking also, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I, I will with God's help. Let us pray. Faithful God, you work in us and for us, even when we don't even know it. When our path has led us away from you, you guide us back to yourself. We thank you for calling your servants, Kelly and Ed, to the fellowship of your people. Renew in them the covenant you made in their baptisms. By the power of your spirit, strengthen them in faith and love that they may serve you with joy to the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, on behalf of the congregation, we welcome you as official members of Supplee Church. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. you may be seated. You're welcome. Let us enter into this time of sustained prayer. Something new for you this week. Um, as I pray with you and I say the word, the refrain, O merciful God, we respond together by saying, hear our prayer. That's all. We'll practice. O merciful God, hear our prayer. Let us now call to mind all who are in need and commend them to God's transforming care. Holy Lord, for those who are alone, for widows and widowers and orphans and for the divorced, O oh, merciful God, hear our prayer. For the imprisoned, for those whose only home is the streets, and for those caught in addiction, O oh, merciful God, hear our prayer. For the hungry, for those who cannot feed their children, and for the unemployed, O oh, merciful God. For refugees, for victims of warfare, for those who are suffering in the after effects of earthquakes and hurricanes, and for those held in poverty by racial discrimination, O oh, merciful God. For the people of our nation, our city and our community, O oh, merciful God. For artists and writers and poets, and for all who think on the edge of society, O oh, merciful God. For the church, 
universal and the church local, its leaders formed by the life-giving word of Christ, O merciful God. For this assembly, everyone here and now in this place, feeding on the word of Christ, O merciful God. O merciful God, hear our prayer for those known to us in this church who we lift to you this day, for Karen and Bob, and Beth, and Nancy, and Jane, baby Joey, for Evelyn, for Gail, for Nick, for Bob, for John, and the many more who we carry on our hearts and we trust are known to you. O oh, merciful God, with Moses and Elijah and all the people of God, with a church throughout the ages bearing witness to the great light of God shining in dark places, we commend to you all for whom we pray. We thank you for being in relationship with us and assuring us that we can always entrust our prayers to you. Hear us now in a chorus of voices, pray using the very words Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will now collect, we will now accept the morning offering. and earth, you call us to leave behind our preoccupations and to follow you into the future. Sometimes we find your call challenging. We are comfortable, even complacent, remaining in the present. May this act of giving represent our willingness to follow where you lead. Receive these gifts as our way of applauding your power and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
So if you must leave before the annual meeting, and then I'll say, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Otherwise, be seated so we're certain to have a quorum. Now, are we, are we going to have a table up here? Thank you. There were copies of the annual report in the narthex. Does anyone need one? <laughs> 